Hi, thanks for joining us again on Celebrating Act Two. Art and I have a very special guest, an old friend, but a very special guest, right, Art? You bet. Herbie J. Pilato. He's an author. He's everything classic TV. He's written about Gidget. He's written about all the boys of classic TV. He's written, I think, at least four books on uh, the Bewitch series, Elizabeth Montgomery, Mary Tyler Moore. I mean, he got this background because he started his entire career as a page for NBC, the Johnny Carson show. So he's steeped in this. And as I say, he's got about a dozen books. And uh, what are we gonna, he's also an author uh, of not only these books, but he's a producer and an actor, just an amazing background in television. And what are we gonna talk about today, John? His new book, which I love, Art and I are fans of, is called Retroactive Television. And I like the subtitle, get this. The subtitle says, it's an in-depth perspective mm. on classic TV's social circuitry. And one of the things I love about Herbie J is that he is not only a fan of classic TV that, that we all grew up with, but he is a smart writer. He's an intelligent analyst of what this means to us, to our culture, and how it affects us, how it affected us as children, and quite frankly, how it affects us today. Mm -hmm. So let's bring Herbie J on and say welcome. Good to see you again. Hi, Herbie J. Hey, hey John. Hey, Art. How are you? Uh, Herbie J, the, the subtitle of this book is important to me because I think it tells everything we need to know to, to pick this book up, and that is it's an in-depth perspective. Um, you have really gone through classic television from the early days to what, the 70s or 80s or so. And by the way, the perspective means that you're also talking about television today, how it compares, why it's different. And the real question that maybe you, you answer in the book, I don't want to give it away, is ha is classic television better for us? Was it better then than it is now? So it, my question for you, though, sorry, sorry to wax on. Uh, my question is, what made you write this? Because you've written so many books about so many aspects and stars of television. What made you write this in-depth perspective? Well, this book really goes to the core of what I've been trying to do and, and do with my other books, but it just brings it all full circle. My, not just with my books, but my career, you know, as the founder and the uh, executive director of the Classic TV Preservation Society, my nonprofit organization, which is dedicated to um, the positive influence of classic TV shows. I've, I've wanted to write about this particular subject in depth. I've touched on it with the Bewitch books and Kung Fu and Bionics and all the other books, but this really brings it on home. And that phrase, <clears throat> excuse me, Social circuitry. I made that up. <laughs> That's mine. I <laughs> created that. Um, because people have read that and I'm like, what? What is that? I, and I tie it in with like the electric, uh, you know, aspects of the actual TV set, you know, the circuits of the TV set and, and how it circulates, you know, the, the, the show circulates into our brain. Yes. And the, the, the wonderful uh, image and illustration for the cover of the book, which was created by Elaine Byers, who's just a genius. You know, uh, she- Herbert, did... Herbert J., I, I want to stop just for a second because you sort of glossed over the social circuitry. And um, I have to tell you that uh, we we have uh, uh, interviewed a lot of authors. Uh, I took about seven pages of notes and I'm not going to go to all of them because I love the interest of it. But it seems to me, through the interviews you did of people that you know in the industry, because you've grown up yeah. there, you've talked about, why these shows got on the air in the first place of the yeah. of the conversations that that yeah. is, that's what i found uh as fascinating as anything else in there uh and so i i didn't want to gloss over that social circuitry because it, th this is one of the most unusual facets of this book compared to almost anything else i've read on on a, a tv or hollywood or anything else the why is why these things ever made it to the screen or didn't? Well, and it's not so much as to why or how they made it to the screen, but once they did, 
what that effect was on the viewer. You know, and, and it's not where the producers of Perry Mason said, hey, we're going to create a show where people are then going to be so inspired that they're going to become lawyers, too, in real life. You know, but that is what happened. And that really is the side sub message of the book is, is that classic TV shows through the years have in inspired people to become either doctors, attorneys, uh, the scientific research that transpired in cybernetics because of the six million dollar man of the bionic woman people became government agents because of the six million dollar man of the bionic woman families learned to communicate more productively because of father knows best the brady bunch the partridge family that really is the core message of the book is that proving and statistically and just through the research i did that yes people have been a fuck or have been affected <laughs> by society uh, or by uh, classic TV shows in a positive way. Mm. Well, it's it's more than, as you point out, Herbie, it's the, the, the book is very sophisticated, very, it's an easy read. It's a fun read. Mm. Um, live through all those old shows as I did and Art did. It's a it's a kick and a hoot to to uh, read the stories as Art says of the people who made these shows. By the way, you have captured some wonderful behind the scenes stories. Not of only how the shows were made and how they got made or why they got made, but the people who made them. Um, my favorite is Peter Ackerman and his father. Yeah. Uh, I won't go into it, but it's a wonderful story, a very human story about people who who wanted to make great television, and and did. Um, so, but your book is sophisticated in the sense that it's really multi-layered. You're not only talking about the the fact that people were trying to make uplifting, kind, positive shows that that helped people and help society, but they were doing it in just every fashion you can imagine. You go through sitcoms, you go through uh, a variety shows, and, and you trace the history of it. That's another aspect. It's a, it, this is a history book. <laughs> yeah, well, it, yes, and I, I almost called it an in-depth history of classic television, but it's not a full history of television it's more of a focus on the shows through history so it's it, it is a history book and yet it's not so it's more like i say a chronicle and a study of classic television as opposed oh, yeah. to a history book absolutely, absolutely. And by the way i'd like well, to I, uh, i'd I, like I, to offer that when uh, people buy this book and it's available on Amazon right now and i'm sure just google it and you'll find lots of different ways to to acquire it but i actually went by you have some like really cool listings in there where you accumulate stuff like a history of television the epilogue i mean there are sections that you can just go back and spend maybe a half hour going through and say oh wait i didn't know that or did that come before that and then you go back to like 19 in the 30s when the stuff really started first coming through uh and a lot of the firsts of the political debates and a lot of those kinds of things uh, things that we sort of knew, especially if we grew up in that time, but it's all in one place. And I'm going to predict that uh, if this is not already ad adopted or it should be, it should be adopted because it's relatively new out there by any uh, serious school teaching yeah. anything about whether it be um, uh, the entertainment industry, this should be the primary resource for anybody who wants to know what one on the television and yeah, yeah absolutely every media student should read this book absolutely uh, yeah and and mark they'll be marking every page <laughs> with a highlighter Thank you. Thank hey you. um you know you there's so much fun in this book uh because you you kind of attack uh attack's not the right word you analyze and give me give give us the background for groups of uh television scenes one of which is uh, the um, groundbreaking shows of diversity. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, J Julia, is it uh, Julia and others? I thought that was a wonderful chapter proving that people at every age were trying to break ground, trying to pass along positive values. And uh, it's not just, you know, modern day stuff. No, it's, and those, I mean, if it wasn't for Julia, there wouldn't be the diversity that there is today. And even she, at the time, Diane Carroll, there were still some complaints that that show um, did not meet the, the standards of, of the African community, uh, African American community. And she was upset about it, you know, because they, yeah. Um, there were some sectors who, that felt that, well, she's too successful to be, uh, you know, to, to have to connect with the mainstream African American community. And she was like, well, gosh, I can't please every anybody. And here yeah. she was trying to do this positive um, character, this positive African American character, and who was successful. And then there were people saying, you can't, that that doesn't connect with the mainstream. So. Yeah. You know, it was it, it was very hard on her because she 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 worked very uh, diligently to make that show stand out, and it was groundbreaking. And in in history, as you look back, it did so much, and it's been embraced, you know, by various cultures. But at the time, there were some issues with it. Yeah. Um, well, I'm I'm just give a quick list of some of the names that you mention in that chapter. Um, uh, Ricardo Montalban, we don't think of him as breaking ground, but right. he was mm. being a Mexican descent or actually a Me originally born in Mexico. That was a big deal for him to move yeah. from movies as the hunk, the Spanish hunk, to move right. to television. Uh, right. Kung Fu, of course, even though, uh, you know, the lead character is played by a white guy, they're wonderful. Asian yeah, actors and yeah. Asian so let me. I, I'd like to comment on that right first. All because kung fu has gotten in recent years has been attacked by the media and whatever, saying that you know that it didn't do this and they should have had a lead Asian American right. actor. Okay, let me make this very clear. First of all, Bruce Lee did not create kung fu. Okay, Ed Spielman and Howard Friedlander created kung fu in the '60s long before Bruce Lee had a similar idea that he brought to the studio. All right, number two, David Carradine, they were looking for a, someone who was a, a calmer presence. And the character of Kane is half Asian, half American. So there's that. So Bruce Lee tried out for the role, but he didn't get it. He didn't get the role because he was Asian American. He didn't get the role because he was too tough. And yet at the same time, a lead actor at the time who was Asian American in a series would not have cut it in America. America right. just wasn't ready for it. Right. But the supporting cast, each and every one of those characters or actors were Asian Americans. And that show put a, gave a lot of work to Asian Americans in the 70s when no one else was. And not only that, but these characters were not stereotypical. Asian Americans. Yeah. They were not house boys like they were on Bonanza and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. This did a lot for the Asian American community. Yeah. And Guy Lee, who was an Asian American casting director, had said that, and I interviewed him for the book, and he knows what that show did for the Asian American community. So I just wanted to clear that up because they've been, you know, it's, the show has been attacked in recent years and it's been unfair. Well, that's a great example of the perspective that's part of the title of your book. And you, when you, you discuss all these shows, yeah, there's a historical element of they were groundbreaking and this one did broke this ground and that broke. But there's also the perspective of, you know, why they were groundbreaking, how they happened. And maybe they weren't perfect, you know, but they really made a big difference. Uh, one of my favorite names, which you never ever hear anywhere, is Beulah Bondi. And you mentioned her. Yes, I um, do. She had her own show. Um, you, you, she was mentioned, I'm, I'm looking at my notes. She was mentioned, I think, along with um, the Rural series. They're all those uh, Green Acres, Real McCoys, uh, wow. and, the, and of course, the classic Andy Griffith show. Yeah. Uh, but they were all, as you point out in the book, they were all morality plays. Mm -hmm. And morality is another issue that you touch on throughout your book. 
that these shows of the classic television era, they really did bring morality. They, they reflected classic American values and mores. And I think, as you pointed out, that's what affected so many people. Well, you, they had each of the shows back in the day had that stamp of approval by the, I, I, guess I forget what the- Oh, the, the NAB, NAB, yeah. Yeah. And you, the you code of practice, that? yeah. Yes. What is it? The, the NAB code of, I think it was good practice. Good, uh, good practice. practice, right. You know, and it was like, that made sure that this would be quality programming, that there would be nothing offensive, that it would be, you know, a very positive thing. For some reason, that's been removed. Okay, yeah. because that means that you can offend now if you want. But what's interesting today is that they offend, maybe not with cultural uh, attacks, but they offend with violence and vulgarity. Like that's okay. Yeah. So why is that okay to offend with vulgar words and violent scenes, but it's not okay, you know, to to explore the offense of of certain of, of minority groups or whatever in a non-offensive way so sure. that really riles me up sure and and you mentioned uh, violence you you touch on uh, cop shows you touch on westerns uh and in each case you're not only talking about the history you're talking about the behind the scenes who made these shows how they came to be and you analyze what they really mean what did they mean then and what do they mean to us today and maybe we should have more of them yeah, I think, you know, the, what we had in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and to some extent the early 80s, is just over. You know, I've learned to come to peace with it. You know, I've learned, you know what? <laughs> things, things are just never going to go back. They're never going to make the shows like they used to make. If I, if I, because I try to watch the new shows. We've talked about this in the past. I try to watch the new shows. But if it's, if I'm not distracted by the bazillion commercials, I'm ups I get upset with the everybody looking so unhappy and all the characters being sardonic and sarcastic. Nobody's smiling. And God forbid you have a happy ending. Yeah. You can't have well, a happy ending today. But yeah. Herbie J, Herbie J, okay, what you've done is you've captured us, captured for us a time that's not going to return. Why isn't it going to return? Yeah. Because non-broadcast TV, the streaming services, cable, um, all of those don't have any restrictions at all. And and right. uh, uh, broadcast TV somehow figures they have to try to compete with them. But I'd like to switch gears just for a second, because in all the interviews that we've done, we've never, I'd like to give you, if, if, if you'd like to take a few minutes and talk about this nonprofit that you've put together. Yeah, it was inspired, the Classic TV Preservation Society was inspired by Elizabeth Montgomery, it all comes back to Bewitched. Um, she did, she was an amazing person who used her public persona for the, the higher good of all. And she, she dedicated much of her time and money to um, those um, in, the, in the disabled community. She recorded uh, books for the blind and the visually impaired. She was one of the first celebrities to advocate for those who were suffering from AIDS. Uh, she was just an amazing, amazing person. And she did a lot of charity work, as did Mary Tyler Moore. So I knew that I one day wanted to somehow create a nonprofit. And that's something you usually do when you retire. You know, you go, well, I'm going to have a nonprofit. Well, I did that 10 years ago. And, and I essentially would start with um, TV and self-esteem seminars that I bring to schools and colleges community centers, community, uh, senior centers, and businesses, and talk about the positive influence of classic TV show. It kind of curtailed a little bit with the pandemic, but I'm now getting back into gear with that. Hmm. Well, okay, by the way, you're not retired at all. Not only do you still have a lot of active pro projects, yes. you've already written over a dozen books, but you've got two or three more coming down the pipe, don't you? Right. Yes. I have uh, a new Sean Connery biography, which will be... Uh, published in October 2024, uh, excuse me, 2023, with the 40th anniversary of Never Say Never Again, which was his last Bond book. And Barbara Carrera, who was the Bond girl in Never Say Never Again, has written the foreword to that. And the introduction is written by Richard DeMarco, Sean's lifelong friend. I also have a Diana Rigg biography coming out, a 
biography of Lucas and Spielberg and their most iconic movies. And what else? I have a new TV movie or TV memories Christmas book that will explore all the TV animated and live action and Christmas specials of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Oh, that'll be, mm. that'll be great. That'll yeah. be great. Now book every Christmas from Herbie J. I, I guess so. I love it. Well, Herbie J, this book is, um, as Art points out, it, it's a textbook. Mm. It's a history book. But it's easy to read. Easy to read. Yeah, easy to read. It's behind the scenes stories. Um, it's just wonderful on so many levels. And it's a chock full book, a couple of hundred pages. So where they're going to get their money's worth, I, that's all I can say. I hope so. I hope they're pleased with it. Because, yeah, I tried to make everybody happy. You know, I'm not really a foo-foo writer. And when I say foo-foo, you know, too academic. I, I've never been an academic type writer. But this is probably the most academic book I've ever done. And uh, and also the, the, the Sean Connery book is very academic, as is the Diana Rigg. So those are, I guess I'm... I'm expanding in that way, but I've always tried to make them, whether they're academic or not, I've tried to make them fun and easy reads. Yeah. As I didn't want it to, never want it to be too stuffy. Well, this is great for people uh, of my age who actually lived and saw all those mm -hmm. old shows and remember the, what you're talking about. But it's also great for younger generations because it puts early TV into perspective. And it gives us a great analysis for the medium, which we need, because while we are never going to go back, we sure need a good perspective. We sure need to be doing positive art. And, and also, and by, the, by the way, there are, there, are, there are at least a half a dozen uh, cable and streaming services that are just about dedicated to the classic uh, program so that you don't have to go search on YouTube and you can do that because there's some of it over there. Right. But yes, there are channels yeah, no, that are on 24-7 with all these wonderful classic shows. I wish they had the Ann Southern show uh, 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 available. It'll come. I, yeah. It'll come. Mm. Yeah, there's Pluto TV. There's Me TV. Uh, decades just switched their format, but there's Cozy TV. Yeah, there's so many out there. You know, Hallmark still also, by the way, they try to incorporate classic TV stars in their new movies which I think is terrific. Uh, so, so there is, you know, there are some classic TV stars that are actually working today, and they should be right. in new movies. Thank, thankfully, uh, uh, to a Hallmark. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been an amazing conversation, Herbie J. It really is. It always is uh, with you. We can't wait for your next books to come out and uh, have you back and and talk about uh, those in, in more depth. And we need to have a Christmas special, John. Why don't you plan that for later this year so that we get in touch with Herbie J for, so that we can promote some Christmas books because he's idea. always got fun books. That would be great. Oh, and I wanted to mention you that Eric Scott has, of the Waltons has written the foreword to the retro book. Yeah, and really yes. a nice piece. Yeah. Honored. I was honored to have Eric do that. Yeah. And by the way, you guys are friends from way back, aren't you? About... 12 years, I, I met him at one of the Hollywood shows when I met all the Waltons, and I had just finished watching the Waltons first run, or in reruns, and I had not seen the show in a, in a long time, so when I met them, I was like, oh my, God. it was just like it was 1975. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, we met at, at Barrett, he's just, he's a terrific human being, a wonderful guy. Good, well, I hope everybody gets a hold of this book and enjoys it, and maybe meets you at one of your many book signings you're going to be doing this year. That would be lovely. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.